Swinet. It's time for a new era of communication in the swine industry. One that you can get the latest updates while commuting or driving to farms. Here you will have the brightest minds of the global swine industry in your pocket. A lot of the contributing factors to mortality from both an infectious and non-infectious standpoint really occur early on in that pig's life. Piglet birth weight and colostrum management, weaning age, those factors really do have long-term impacts on the animal. When we further overlay the interaction with various infectious agents and put those on on top of those various factors, it's the combination of this intertwined, extremely complicated matrix that ultimately results in, in the observed mortality. Swine It podcast is only possible with the support of forward-looking and innovative sponsors like NutriQuest, experts serving producers and delivering breakthrough solutions. Genesis, the first power in genetics. Zinpro, essential trace minerals, exceptional performance. Every Pig, a simple yet powerful pig health and production management tool. Just all, always one step ahead in swine feeding. Welcome to Swine Eat Podcast. My name is Marcel Gonçalves, your host for today's episode. This episode's sponsor highlight is about Gestal. Celebrating its 25th anniversary, Gestal manufactures the original wireless standalone swine feeding system designed by pork producers for pork producers. They are simple, reliable, and provide peace of mind 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Gestal is not just manufactured by an equipment company but by a family pork production business with a slat-level understanding. Just all, always one step ahead in swine feeding. Hello everyone, today our guest is Dr. Jordan Gebhardt from Kansas State University and this is the second episode of a two-part a series here where the first one we had was about wind finish mortality in known infectious causes and uh, so if you missed that make sure to go back and check that out and today we're going to chat about uh, infectious causes uh, in the wind finish mortality so uh, thanks again for being here today Jordan thank you again for having me Marcio very good the first one Jordan is systems based overview of infectious etiologies right what, what do you mean by that so that's the classical way that uh, we learn about disease um, is a systems based. So the respiratory system, the enteric or, or GI tract. Mm -hmm. So from a, a physiologic body system standpoint. So that we do that because in many cases, diseases such as respiratory disease is caused by contributing viruses, bacteria, and the ultimate culmination of all these different etiologies and pathogens is respiratory disease. So this is the, the common way that, that it's described and, and certainly has a lot of merit to, um, to understanding what are the underlying causes of these, um, these types of disease processes. But what we did and, and what we tried to do with the literature review was to look at, take a step back and look at it from a slightly different perspective. And what we had uh, decided to do was think about the way that the in industry handles these different types of pathogens. So what we describe as an intervention-based approach. Mm -hmm. um, so there are very varying levels of, of interventions and levels of aggressiveness that producers in the industry take for various pathologies. Mm -hmm. One um, would be aggressive depopulation. If a herd gets a specific disease, we will depopulate that herd, um, disinfect, and then start over with a new group of animals. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is the most significant um, approach that can be taken. Well, a step below that would be elimination of certain pathogens over time. And there are a number of ways to do this, but ultimately they leverage the knowledge of immunity as well as uh, the not introducing naive animals to that population for a group of time, ultimately with the goal of eliminating that pathogen from the herd. And then finally, what producers in, in some scenarios do with certain diseases is not do anything at all um, from a elimination or depopulation standpoint. They take less aggressive measures, whether it be treating or controlling affected animals, and ultimately have a, a lower magnitude of impact on the way they go about controlling that pathogen. Very good. Can you briefly mention some of the diseases that 
veterinarians focus on the depopulation versus elimination? Yeah, so some of the examples uh, where depopulation has been used over time, uh, swine dysentery would be an example of that. Very nasty. The clinical disease in the U.S. Um, is much less frequent compared to historic levels uh, years and decades ago. Um, APP, actinobacillus pleuronemoniae, mm -hmm. uh, very nasty. Again, the, the incidence is much less frequent today compared to the past, and a lot of this is due to, to pretty significant control measures that veterinarians and producers have taken mm -hmm. to control and eliminate this disease. Another example would be pseudorabies virus, one of the, the few diseases that uh, have, have actually been eradicated from a commercial production standpoint within the United States. And again, this was a, a very long effort by the industry, producers, the, uh, the government to get our domesticated swine population to a level where we can deem them free from pseudorabies virus. And then finally, one example would be foreign animal diseases. Mm -hmm. The major ones, um, as of note recently, mm -hmm. of very high importance, African swine fever, classical swine fever, foot and mouth disease. Mm -hmm. If those diseases were to be introduced into the U.S., very aggressive depopulation measures and, and other procedures would be taken into place to very rapidly attempt to control the spread of these diseases. That makes sense. And how about elimination? So when the burden of... Uh, d pathogen or infectious etiologies is too great to effectively manage and uh, we decide that as, as veterinarians, as producers, we need to do something, elimination would be the next step. Uh, obviously less um, significant in approach compared to depopulation. Some of the common pathogens that uh, elimination procedures are used for would be mycoplasma, hyopneumonia, um, which is a, a etiology that interacts with a lot of other respiratory bacteria and viruses. And the evidence is becoming more clear in the literature of the value of having your growing pig population mycoplasma negative. Um, so this is an approach that uh, a lot of systems are taking to try to eliminate mycoplasma hyopneumoniae from their breeding pig population um, because of the impact that it has on downstream production. And some other examples would be PERS virus, for example, as well as swine influenza virus. Very good, Jordan. How about um, if we transition now for infectious agents often managed without depopulation or elimination, and starting by Haemophilus parasuis? Yeah, so Haemophilus uh, parasuis is a common inhabitant of the upper respiratory tract of pigs and can result in a number of different uh, clinical signs. Uh, inflammation of multiple membranes within the, the body, polycerositis, as well as getting to the blood causing septicemia and getting into a bunch of different types of tissues like the joints, the, the meninges, um, which would lead to neurologic signs, as well as the lungs. Um, so very common, many times doesn't lead to significant disease, but in some scenarios with various interactions with other pathogens can certainly be a contributing factor to mortality. Very good. How about Pastorella multicida? So progressive atrophic rhinitis, very common historically. You see the, the very characteristic deviations of the snout um, becoming much less prevalent and, and we don't see that nearly as commonly today as, as perhaps we had in the past, um, but still is a contributing factor to pneumonia. How about Bordetella bronchoseptica? So that's a bacteria that has been associated with the progressive form of atrophic rhinitis along with the pasturella, but now primarily it's a pathogen that uh, could potentially lead to pneumonia as well. Very good. How about a non-exotic pneumonia, also known as mycoplasma in general? Yeah, so that's a categorization of uh, types of mycoplasma other than mycoplasma hyopneumoniae. And some of these different types can cause different clinical signs, arthritis, polycerositis, as well as the, the destruction and loss of red blood cells in some scenarios. So uh, these mycoplasmas can be fairly commonly identified in certain scenarios, but the overall impact on mortality is uh, relatively low. Okay. How about Actinobacillus suis? A. suis, again, is a, a common inhabitant of the upper respiratory tract. Um, it's, in the, it's, it's similar to uh, Actinobacillus pleuronemoniae, mm -hmm. however, uh, much less severe when those animals are affected by clinical disease compared to APP.
Makes sense. How about Lausonia intracellularis, also known as ileitis? Yeah, ileitis, garden hose gut, proliferative porcine enteropathy, all names that uh, describe the clinical disease associated with Lausonia. And in many cases, vaccines are, have been developed and can be delivered in different forms, and uh, they seem to be uh, fairly effective in assisting producers and veterinarians control this disease. Very interesting. How about Salmonella? Salmonella is, a, is one of those types of bacteria that the, the naming and the logistics of from a, from a young person and a student can be quite confusing. Um, Salmonella enterica serotype type of Miriam, as well as the serotype cholera suis are, are the two, the big ones of primary concern. Type of Miriam now in, in recent years has become more common than cholera suis. Um, and the important part with Salmonella is the impact that it potentially could have on human health because it is a potential zoonotic agent, um, maximizing and, and making sure animals are healthy is not only important for the animal standpoint, but also minimizing the risk that humans can um, become affected by this disease. Very good. How about Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli? So post-weaning uh, diarrhea, scours is a common issue, um, and, and in some many cases, uh, E. coli can be a contributing factor. Um, but edema disease is also a form of uh, clinical disease associated with E. coli, where there's a certain toxin produced that uh, that affects the blood vessels and call, causes edema and essentially swelling of multiple types of tissue. So not as not as common as the uh, more classical scour or E. coli diarrhea that we see. Um, but certainly can have some, some impressive lesions when it does uh, enter our swine herds. Interesting. How about uh, rotavirus? So rotavirus is again pretty complicated with different groups, the type A, B, C, um, and rotavirus most commonly can result in lack of absorption of nutrients or malabsorptive diarrhea in post weaning pigs. Um, and it's most commonly uh, the most significant impact is with other co-infections. Rotavirus, in, from a pre-weaning standpoint, with suckling piglets, is very important. We can see it post-weaning as well, and it seems to be significant um, when, it, when it interacts with other enteric pathogens as well. Causing some vomit sometimes. And yeah, exactly. Yep. Very good. How about a streptococcus? So strep suis uh, can manifest in a number of different ways, arthritis, swollen joints, neurological disease, as well as a bunch, several other different types of abnormalities. Uh, strep is, is very common within human populations, within pigs. It's a, it's a normal bacterial inhabitant of many different uh, surfaces in uh, the respiratory tract. Uh, it, it can be a substantial contributor in some cases to mortality. Very good. How about Staphylococcus? So the two big diseases in pigs that are associated with Staphylococcus are greasy pig disease as well as Staph aureus infections. Greasy pig disease is caused by Staphylococcus hyacus and it can be challenging, um, but overall not all that common and doesn't have a huge impact on post weaning mortality. And Staph aureus is important, um, again, going back to the potential zoonotic nature of that disease. Um, MRSA, uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, is a, is a human uh, pathogen, potentially, and, and in certain scenarios, hospitals, for example. So controlling that from a, a pig standpoint, not common, or I'm not saying that that mm -hmm. association, MRSA and humans, mm -hmm. is directly associated right. with what we do in animals, but uh, that the Staph organism is important to consider mm -hmm that it potentially could be zoonotic in nature. How about erysipelas? So erysipelas is the, the classic lesion that we see with this is the diamond skin disease. And the lesions can be pretty uh, impressive. And in addition to those skin lesions we can sometimes see, it can also cause joint inflammation and arthritis, as well as changes to the, the leaflets um, with it, that make up the valves within the heart itself, or endocarditis. Um, so it, it's not uncommon, um, and when we do see it, the, the lesions we see can be quite impressive. Very good. Uh, very nice. What are your thoughts on porcine uh, circovirus? 
So PCV, when it uh, came in the, and it had had a substantial impact on the swine industry. And fortunately, that's it's one of those pathologies and one of those diseases that vaccines are actually very, very effective for. Right. So we're fortunate to have access to, to very good and effective vaccines for PCV2 um, specifically. Um, so in well-vaccinated herds, overall mortality associated with this disease is relatively minor. Right. How about, uh, lastly here, uh, neurological syndromes associated with viral agents? So this is a, a relatively new area with, uh, um, in the classic, some of the lesions that you can see and some of the characteristic clinical signs would be various neurological abnormalities, uh, shaker pig syndrome, for example, and, and things that the animal just isn't behaving normally from a neurologic standpoint. And there's been a lot of research, and, and as our diagnostic abilities rapidly improve over time, we can detect a lot of different types of viruses and uh, different types of etiologic agents. Some of the important ones that they have identified and made associations would be porcine cipellovirus, um, astrovirus. Um, so there's a lot to be learned in this area still, mm -hmm. um, but it is a an interesting area um, in, a, in a case where our improved diagnostic abilities with the molecular techniques that uh, our diagnostic labs are innovating um, really are doing some pretty impressive things to isolate some, some pretty uh, new and, and developing viruses that are believed to be associated with disease. NutriQuest delivers targeted breakthrough solutions to animal producers via nutritional and non-nutritional products, services, and technologies. At NutriQuest, we believe in ingenuity inspired by servitude and that our success comes from helping producers realize improved profitability through optimized technologies and efficient operation. Very nice, Jordan. Wow, this is, uh, we cover a lot of ground here in a short amount of time. Uh, what are our closing thoughts here as we think about wind finish mortality and infectious causes? Yeah, so one of the, the key takeaways from the review that, uh, that we've done and, and hope to have published uh, uh, in the near future would be that a lot of the contributing factors to mortality from both an infectious and non-infectious standpoint really occur early on in that pig's life. Going back to the non-infectious factors, um, the piglet birth weight and colostrum management, weaning weight and weaning age, those factors really do have long-term impacts on the animal. And when we further overlay the interaction with various infectious agents and put those on on top of those various factors, it's the combination of this intertwined, extremely complicated matrix that ultimately results in, in the observed mortality. So a lot of the things that, that we attempt to address by controlling disease through depopulation, elimination, or other management strategies, as well as the non-infectious and understanding how our people are, are taking care of the pigs themselves, all of this intertwined together has the, the impact on mortality, and a lot of it happens before the post-weaning period itself. Yeah, this is a very complex subject. and. Um really appreciate all of the work you've done in this area um yeah and, and if anyone in the audience has not uh, listened to the other episode that, that we had jordan about no infectious causes and also if if you are looking for his uh, famous three questions that uh, it's in that episode absolutely and, um, and we go from there thanks a lot jordan i really appreciate your time thank you very much marcio it's been a pleasure Hey everyone, please share our episodes with as many people as you can so we can continue to impact the life of swine professionals from around the globe with the wisdom of our great guests. Before you go, make sure to get in our waitlist for the Swine Talks web conference, the first online conference of the global swine industry, an update on hot topics and we're even going to have some controversial topics of the global swine industry so you can leverage that knowledge in your day to day. Go to swinetalks.com and get on our wait list. We'll talk soon.